Welcome to the Pat Mayo Experience, presented by DraftKings, and welcome to the final major week of 2022. Huge lineup for you, five days of open championship coverage, and that's just before the tournament actually tees off. We got the research show. That's today. That's what you're watching and or listening to at the moment. We got the DraftKings picks, the bets with Feinberg, the player-by-player player with Rick Gaiman, and then boom, live, 9, 15 a.m. Eastern time on Wednesday, myself, Toe Tag and Tambo, Tower Tambolini in studio, breaking down the weather, the final picks, and answering all of your questions. So tune in to it all. Remember to smash the like button to the episode. Sub to Mayo Media Network. Give me your winner, your early lean for a winner at the old course at St. Andrews down in the comment section. And do I have some giveaways for you this week? Out of the door. We're going with the $100, the $200. Now, I got two big prizes. We might add some during the week, but here's what you do. You want to get into a draw for $500 cash money? Easy stuff. Rate and review the Pat Mayo Experience audio podcast on Spotify, on Apple Podcasts. You rate that five stars. You leave, you know, make something up about something you enjoy about the show. Twitter handle, email address in that review. If you've done it before, there's your chance to get back into it. Those are ballots, a lot of ballots into the giveaway. There's one that's a super ballot if you do it. That's all in the Mayo Media newsletter. You can find that down in the description to go join and all of the giveaway details will be in there. How you get ballots into this draw for the $500 in cash. Uh, I have a Masters Polo from Augusta National, size large. It's black. It's very nice. Never been open. You could win that as a part of the secondary draw, and maybe we'll add some other ones throughout the course of the week if enough people go and do this. Play in the Pat Mayo Experience DraftKings Listeners League. We got it maxed out. We need to fill it so we don't look stupid. There's no rake, so it's the best tournament on DraftKings. $15 to play, three max entry. Go hit that right now in fantasynational.com for all your research needs. That's what I'll be doing for my walkthrough. Fantasynational.com slash Mayo gets you 20% off of any of the memberships no better time hey take the annual right now you go open to open easy stuff get 20 percent off while you're at it as well joining me on the line to break this all down from the golf betting system and golf betting system podcast steve bamford it's hard to work out you are on top of time zones my friend because i was gonna have to use google for hours and you were just like no here's what the time difference is we can make this work so thank you for joining me not a problem greetings how are you I'm well. I'm excited to be talking about my favorite major and losing money at my favorite major, which I normally do because my guy constantly comes in second place at this tournament. Yeah, it can be frustrating, can't it? Also, it's, it's one of these majors. It's probably, in terms of all the majors, the four that we've got, this one tends to be the one that can be most weather affected, which can clearly cause uh, pain if you're in the if you're actually in the wrong half of the draw or whatever the likes of that. But that's Link's goal. Well, how do you go about that? Because obviously we have to produce content. And usually when I'm making content and I'm recommending a bet, I make the bet at the same time. But it would seem, unless there's a number that you really want to jump on, that the closer you can wait until first tee and to get maybe a sense of what, at least what the weather is going to be like on Thursday. Because that's, I mean, obviously the big one is going to be the Phil Stenson year where there was like a pocket of two hours. And if you weren't in that pocket of two hours, you had absolutely zero chance of winning that tournament. Absolutely. And the, the trouble, you know, we're in a content driven age, aren't we? We need content out there as quickly as possible. So to balance that up, you know, getting a reasoned view, some tips, trying to get a view of the weather, but getting your content out there in a timely manner. People don't want to be waiting until Thursday morning for their for, for the tips. So it's it's a balance. It, clearly for DraftKings, it works on the basis that you can reserve your spots, but and then you can you can leave it late in terms of the weather draw. I mean, it's pointless even really talking about detail around weather at the moment, but you know, it could be blowing 35 miles an hour on certain days and it could be as calm as five miles an hour on others. It's 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 a lottery, it really is. And St. Andrew's so open, so exposed. Um, it's a really weather and wind dependent golf course. It does seem like, at least from the open championships that we've seen at the old course, that we do, I remember even the last one, like Dustin Johnson was way out ahead after two rounds. And I think he like didn't play for... 30 hours or something crazy like that. And he came back to the course and nothing. He had, he had nothing left in the tank. So we can see weather delays. We can see it wind affected. 
I think you just kind of have to take your chances and go with it, don't you? I think yes, generally. Um, unless unless we can see something establishing itself over this weekend or some kind of weather pattern that Windfinder can deal with and handle and move forward, and you can. That's the thing with Windfinder. I know that you use it as your weather app. You, you can see patterns, and they do tend to be quite accurate there. So let's see what happens. But yeah, it's it's basically open championship betting, isn't it? There's that there's that there's well, that element to it. Well, I mean, it's no different. Than, golf is a, as Wiley always says, it's like a kino game anyway. Now you add another unknowable element. I mean, I think it makes, obviously for your outright bets, you want to get the guys in the right side of the draw or the good weather. But on DraftKings, yeah. like you mentioned, the prices don't change. So that's helpful. Yeah. You can wait till the end of the week. And then if you just wanted to play six guys in the morning, just blind or six guys in the afternoon yeah, blind or both, then you just kind of, you, you, you can hedge against the weather a little bit because most people just don't do that with the outright bets. Then it becomes a little bit more difficult. I think so. It's it's the other the other thing here at the old course. It's clearly you know we'll we'll think about the seventeenth road hole, the difficulty there, the bunker, whatever you know, the t notorious bunker. But when 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 this when the weather lays down here, the scoring can be remarkably low, and there is a conversation that's already being had about you know could, would could could this potentially be you know, one of the lowest open championship winning scores that we've ever seen. If, you know, with the technology developing now, there's very little room for expansion at St Andrews. They can't really they can't really add length to the course. You know, is this is this the year where you know some serious low scoring is actually had if the weather lays down this year? It's interesting to think about that. And it's funny that like at the U S open, I like when it was at Aaron Hills and Brooks and a bunch of guys end up double digits under par that everyone is outraged by the entire thing. But when they had it at Aaron Hills, it followed the very similar concept of what we see at a lot of the open championship rota courses, where if the wind doesn't pick up, it's going to be super easy. And that was like Aaron Hills. We had no yeah. wind for four days. That's the primary defense of the course. So yeah, if there's no wind, guys are going to go low. And no one seems to have a problem with it for the Open Championships. Like, yeah, you could win this at 27 under, or it could be plus five, uh, depending on how the weather goes. So I think you need guys that can be tailored for both of those circumstances if you can see anything coming within the wind. So let's talk about the course a little bit. You kind of hit on it. There's not a ton of room for expansion at St. Andrews. It's probably going to play right around 7,300 yards. It is a par 72, but not in the conventional way. There's only two par fives. There's only two par threes which you just don't see a lot of ever <laughs> no two par threes two par fives 570 is the first par five they call that hole across the fifth and then on the back side you've got the 14th 614 yards and that's cannily cannily called long that's a long hole so yeah two par threes 187 174 so just a snidge over 7,300 yards past 72 with those 14, yeah, 14 par fours. The As you say, that is a setup and it's, it's unique. It very, it's very, very unique. And outside of like the very famous difficult holes, like you mentioned, like the road hole, number 17 at St. Yep. Andrews, it does like when you go back and looks at the look at looks, look, listen to me, uh, when you go back and look at the types of players that have played well here, there's a few trends that do stick out to me. And some of it is weather related and some of it isn't like the bombers are going to get substantial roll on their ball. If it is a bit baked out and there hasn't been any rain and there's really good conditions. Like unless you hit it into the burn on number one, you can put it about as close as you want to put it to get into your comfort range. And that's kind of the case with a lot of these power fours. Like if you want to be one you want to be 89 yards away on your approach shot? Fine. Go blast it. You want to be 113 away? You can do that as well. I, it's funny to think about John Deere in this way because John Deere is set up very similarly in terms of you can get to the spot where you want to get to on your second shot and be in your most comfortable range. It feels like that's the case for a lot of these holes at St. Andrews where you just see a lot of really good wedge players unless it's 50 mile per hour wins. They can just go attack here. Like if you're making your putts and you're hitting your lob wedge really well you're gonna have a good week yeah uh, and you know you talk about john deere classic you've got zach johnson won this back in 2015 
Well, Zach Johnson used to be the uh, the master with Steve Steve Stricker around TPC Deer Run, didn't he? Absolutely. So I can say here's a, here's a quote from here's a quote from Tiger. If the wind blows, hitting a wedge 30, 40, 50 feet happens a lot. The two the two years that I've played well here, I've lagged putt beautifully, and I've also hit the ball in the right spots. And I, he's had that thirty to fifty feet, uh, you know, chipping game as well. He says also three putt avoidance because these greens here, these double greens are absolutely huge. We're looking at greens this week. This is off the greenskeepers fact sheet that came out yesterday. Fifty percent fescue. They're twenty five percent brown top bent grass. There's ten percent poana in there, and there's fifteen percent of local grasses. So fescue with uh, bent grass are the predominant uh, grasses on the greens. Um, they're looking at you're looking at rough. Apparently, um, it's going to be not that there's a lot of rough on this golf course, but the rough that is there. It's going to be below two inches in thickness, 1.65 it's being quoted at. Fescue and bent grass rough. So not a lot of rough, huge greens, fescue in the main with some bent grass in them as well. But yeah, three putt avoidance. I, I, I looked into this this morning. Zach Johnson actually arriving at St. Andrews in 2015 was in the top 25 on PGA Tour of three putt avoidance. So I don't I don't think that's a bad stat to particularly dig dig into uh, for this tournament because these greens there there is some serious distance putting. Well, we'll look into it over larger ranges during the research portion when I go to Fantasy National and look this up. But yeah. just looking at it at the moment, uh, the top ten over the past thirty six rounds in the field. Well, this is at at the Scottish at the moment. Uh, most of these guys are playing, and you'll recognize some of these names: Hatton, Thomas, Cam Smith, Xander, Kokrak are the top five. Obviously, Rory's not in the field, so he doesn't get included in this. Then you look at Lucas Herbert, Hideki, Mac Hughes, Patrick Cantley, Keegan Bradley, then Ricky Fowler and Justin Rose. Follow that up as the best at three-putt avoidance over the past 36 rounds. But I think the biggest link that we can make to St. Andrews, based on the performance of a lot of these players, the results of a lot of these players, if you can play at Augusta National, apparently you can also do very... And that should make sense. It's a very stacked field. But... Big greens, no rough, although these half fescue greens tend not to play quite as fast as the pure bent grass at Augusta. No, <laughs> no far from it. I think the other the other thing, of course, the difference between St. Andrews, the old course, and Augusta is, I mean, the greens at Augusta are unique, aren't they, with, with the amount of contours on them, the pitch and whatever. There are some holes, especially on the back side at St. Andrews, that have got more pitch, more contours than you actually give them, cre uh, them credit for, especially if you're actually missing greens. So the, the, uh, I know this is something you've re you referenced quite a few times, you know, someone like a Lucas Glover at the RBC Heritage, where he's actually taking putter from off the putting surfaces to scramble. Martin Keimer did that at the US Open that he won at Pinehurst, didn't he? There's that kind of opportunity very much at St Andrews. So when we're talking about short game, it isn't necessarily pitching, it can be of course, putting from off the greens. But distance of putts here, it's definitely, and three putt avoidance, I think, is something definitely to, to take a look into. Tiger Woods 2000, Tiger Woods 2005, Louis Oosthuizen in 2010, then Zach Johnson in 2015. It does scream, absolutely scream, doesn't it? All Augusta National across all three, all, all three of those guys. And even someone like Paul Casey, who's had a lot of good runs at Augusta National, who finished yeah. second to Louis that year in 2010, uh, when Louis just played absolutely out of his mind. Uh, that was my first experience with Louis Eustace, and I was like, this guy might be the best professional. It's th This is a weird comp, and I don't know if it can persist, because Louis is such a good putter, and this guy is not a very good putter and has kind of a disastrous short game, although it's improving a little bit. But I remember watching Louis for the first time hit the ball, just the smooth swing down the middle every single time. Kind of reminds me of Corey Connors. Yeah, potentially. And another link into um, Augusta National, Pat. Last year's Alfred Dunnell Lynx Championship winner around here. Yeah, they play... Um, it's a rotor, isn't it? It's a pro-am. They play two two rounds here on the on the uh, old course, thirty six holes. Danny Willett, Danny Willett won the Alfred Dunhill last year here. So yeah, it's it it really has got um, the Masters, Augusta National, all over it. I'm trying to think of some of the other guys. Brennan Grace won. I I, I always get the Alfred Dunhill. 
rotation one mixed up with the South African one, which I think has exactly the same name, except for... Yeah, Grace, Grace, Grace has won that. Uh, Tyrrell Hatton, of course, a two-time winner. Uh, we also had uh, the Frenchman, um, Victor Perez, won it a few years ago. Um, we've also had Tony Finau play well in it. We've also have seen um, Brooks, Brooks Kepka when he was on the European Tour. He had a very good... He, he, I think he finished third there one year. So there's there's quite a lot of um, of form in there. Let me I'm just let me just have a quick look, and we can look at the list here. Yeah, we got we got Thor uh, Thor Bjorn Olsson was the winner in 2015. Lucas Bjerg. Uh, if you're dating, Lucas Bjergard. <laughs> Lucas Bjergard won there in 2018. But Tyrrell Hatton twice, yeah. Thor Bjorn in 2015. Uh, you've got uh, uh, Brendan Grace in 2012, as you said. Martin Keimer 2010. Um, you can go right back to Patrick uh, Padre Carrington 2006, Lee Westwood 2003. Uh, Hadre, uh, Harrington also won it in 2002. So, yeah, but I'm also seeing names like runner-up names of that tournament. Rory McIlroy. Danny Will won it, Willett was runner-up there before he won it last year. Tyrrell Hatton's name's all over it. Tommy Fleetwood. Brooks kepka has been a runner-up there. So there's lots of players in this field, field that have had success. Rory McIlroy as well at that Alfred Dunhill Lynx um, championship in, in, in the fall over here in Scotland every year. So that's, you know, that's an angle there. If you're looking, if you're, if you're course form nut and, you know, there's, there's plenty of those out there. I, I'm even seeing like the pro-am winners like how Tong won, won the pro-am uh, the year that Lucas Biergaard won. And obviously we, we want to get behind. Uh, I, I mean, I don't know how much we want to get behind how Tong here, but he's at least back in a little bit better form. He, he's looking yep. more like the player he used to be than the player who's ranked like 500th in the world now. He was, uh, he was outstanding a few weeks ago in Germany. Very, very impressive. And the way that he um, he finished, I don't know if you saw it, he, he duffed the chip oh, yeah. on the first playoff hole <laughs> against Tom, your, your friend Thomas Peters. And uh, he, then he, he holds something like a 40-footer on the way back just to uh, to rub salt into Thomas's wounds. And then Thomas, not the greatest of putters, I think he missed like a 10-footer a to take it into a second hole of extra time. But how Tong Lee, again, he's... he's a, and I do you do see, don't you, with these, a lot of these... Um, Open Championship winners have direct form coming to their victory. Decent form. Colin Morikara. I mean, last week, uh, last year, forty to one winner. Colin Morikara finished seventy first at the Scottish Open the week before. But you look at the form before that: fourth at the U.S. Open, and I think he finished in the top three at Memorial. So a third and a fourth out of his th uh, three appearances before he won the actual Open itself. I think Shane Lowry had a couple of decent finishes uh, over in the States in the PGA Tour. I think he's in actually, he finished second at the RBC Canadian Open. He goes on to win the Open. So those form lines in, Frankie Molinari, didn't he? I think he was first at, at Potomac. Then he uh, finished second at the John Deere Classic, arrived 33 to 1, won the Open. So you do see a lot of those hot hands go on and actually take the claret jug. Yeah, the Lowry form was third, eighth, second, twenty eighth coming in. Then he wins the Open Championship, and Molinari had won. Yeah, he won it. He won it. I think it was Avonolf. Yeah, at Potomac for the Quicken Loans Potomac, yeah. back when it That's was right. called that. He was second at the John Deere. I think he had won at Wentworth like six weeks before that. Yeah, white hot form, thirty three to one. So, so it happens. It happens, and that—that's a great steer for now, isn't it? Because we, you know, we we all know the players that are playing well right now. The players that. are you know, Xander, for example. Now, whether you want to be backing Xander at eighteen to one next week, uh, it, you know, it's, it's debatable. But it's it, we might we might be able to snatch a twenty two. So he's just about to win this JP McManus pro am by the looks of it over over in Ireland. So he's in fantastic form. Patrick Cantlay's been playing some great golf. Colin Morikawa was in the top five at the U.S. Open recently, the defending champion. Uh, as you said, how Tong's a winner. So, you know, there's various there's various ways to look at it in terms of form horses, both those that are going to be towards the top of the market, Rory McIlroy, of course, Scotty Scheffler, but also guys that we're going to be particularly be able to pick up at triple digits, like a how Tong Lee. How Tong would be probably the triple digit one that I'd be looking at at the moment. Although I, I'm seeing the odds right now, 40 to one on Louis at DraftKings Sportsbook. I think that just he's so out of sight, out of mind, because people just aren't paying attention to the live tour whatsoever. But he's done a pretty good run over there. He's been fifth. He's been eighth. He's not playing bad golf, albeit it's a 54-hole shotgun scramble event. But 
a first and a second at St. Andrews for Louie and just being so out of sight that how do you think that the live guys will do in this tournament? Because at the U.S. Open, it was kind of eh, but that was a more difficult course that people hadn't seen a whole lot of. This one, I mean, we have some guys on the live tour who have some pretty substantial experience and good experience, winning experience at this course. I think a lot of players, there's been a lot of discord, isn't there? And you, you look at the form of most of those guys that have gone across to live. Now, the form just hasn't been there all year, and that suggests that their mind hasn't been on the job. They've been negotiating through agents. Are they going to make the move? Are they not going to make the move? Now that that move's done, now that that's finished, clearly the social media outrage, the, the journalism and the angles that's been pr pushed them, that isn't over, but the actual decision is made. The discourse, the, the legal challenges, that may go through, but you may start to see now, like a Dustin Johnson, that's clearly showing some better form of late, a Louis Oosthausen. We all, uh, you know, those kind of players, even a Patrick Reed, those players could potentially get into the mix here. It's funny, I've got a statistic here for you in terms of just the way that we we work our predictor model and the way that we take in data. If you, if you look at the top coastal performers over the last five years rolling on coastal golf courses. So that will include the Open. It will also include things like Kapalua, the, the Century Tournament of Champions, anything by the coast. Um, we've got John Rahm leads that over the last five years. Patrick Reed is second. Victor Hovland third. Don't forget, Victor Hovland's won three times. They've all been on coastal golf courses, Puerto Rico and Mayakoba. Brooks Kepka at four. Tony Feen out five. Phil Mickelson at six. Then Rose and Xander. Cam Smith. Colin Morikawa, Jordan Spieth, Justin Thomas. So those are the guys that have done the very best on the PGA Tour last five years on coastal golf courses. How much do you think that the Euro experience really plays into this? Or is that more of the Scottish Open, the Irish Open, or even back when the, you know, I know the Le Club National en France isn't a link style course whatsoever. But there does seem to be an inherent advantage in these smaller type tournaments, at least we've seen historically, of just random names popping up that a lot of American players don't know. People who follow the DP World Tour, formerly the European Tour, are very familiar with. Even if we look at the Scottish Open from 2020, like Johannes Verman is tied with Justin Thomas inside the top 10. And most people are like, who is that guy? And why is he here? Minwoo Lee won that event. Aaron Rye beats Tommy Fleetwood the year before that at the Scottish Open. Would you expect to see a few of these off-the-radar names, primarily European tour players, be there at St. Andrews? Or is St. Andrews sort of the one that, that doesn't really happen at? Well, Paul, don't forget as well, we had, was it Paul Dunn? Amateur? 54-hole leader? Yeah. At the, at the 2015 Open held here at St. Andrews. So, I don't know. I, I, th I think a lot of a lot of it as well will depend on the weather conditions. I really do. I think this was what you know. We were t if we were talking about the Open twelve months ago, it would have been about experience. You must have top ten, top twenty experience at an Open to be able to win it. Then bang, Colin Morikawa debut. Weather wasn't as bad as it was going to be forecasted. The opening few days, I think it was up to 15, 18 miles an hour. And then over the weekend, just fell away. Bang, just goes and wins the Open Championship on debut. So I think I think if conditions are going to be relatively easy, I don't really see a huge advantage for the for the DP World uh, European Tour guys over 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 the PJ Tour guys. And clearly, there's there's a huge class difference. But I think you know there there's definitely is an angle where you may get some uh, some some DP World Tour guys that do get into the mix. You know finding those particular individuals and we you know it might there might be an angle in there just to look at coastal performances uh for players you know either recent or over dp world to a schedule you might be able to get some i know that my my partner in crime paul williams when it comes to links golf he absolutely adores a guy like matthew southgate because when you look at matthew southgate you know very very you know around the globe very little knowledge about the guy but when you look at his expertise it's definitely on coastal tracks and just inevitably a big price is just pops up around coastal golf courses around the dp world tour so you know there are specialists out there that can just pop out and all of a sudden who the hell's this guy in the in the top six coming into saturday 
I would say the the PGA Tour equivalent of that type of player who's actually in the field at the Open Championship would be Aaron Wise, who just seemingly does his best work at coastal courses. Not sure why exactly looking at his game, but something fits his eye. Not entirely sure what it is, but the results have been there for him. All his best results outside of the win he had at the Byron Nelson at that weird open track at Trinity Forest before they got rid of the American-style Lynx course, as they dubbed it, which... I don't really think that it was. I think it was exceptionally hot that week. But either way, that's where he's had his best performances too. Before I let you go, do you have an early lean on a winner as of yet? I like Colin Morikara, the defending champion. I think Patrick Cantlay. You know, he's he's he's, he's flattered to deceive in majors, um, but he was uh, top top uh, was it top fourteen at the U.S. Open. There is also this. You know, we, we like a trend, don't we? But there is this trend in modern major majors at the moment, going back to Bryson. He, you know, where people have finished in the major before they win their major. So Bryson was T5 before he won the 2020 US Open. Hideki Matsuama T13 before he won the 21 Masters. Uh, Phil Mickelson as you would. 21st, though. He was 21st at, Ma- at the Masters. Then he went and won the PGO. Then we've got Ram, top 10. Morikawa, top 5. Thomas, top 10. Matthew Fitzpatrick, top 5. So, yeah, just take just taking that US Open leaderboard. Fitzpatrick, 1. Scheffler, Will Zalatoris. If, if the weather forecast... Um, if the weather forecast isn't going to be too harsh, for me, Willie Z's got to be in the team, I think. Wide fairways, a golf course where accuracy on strokes gained is very, very key. I, I think Zalatoris will be fine around here. Matsuama was four, McElroy five, Morikara five, Keegan Bradley seven. Then we're out to the likes of Woodland, who was top 10. Uh, Power and Ram, top 12. Cantlay, Leishman, top, uh, top 14. So... There's some names there to look at if, if we look if we're going to see that that trend continuing. That's something I'm going to look at. But I think my early leans: Morikawa, Cantlay, Zalatoris for me. It's going to be hard to talk me off of Colin Morikawa. Now that you like him, I like him anyway. Yeah. And if the number is going to be right, which if he doesn't just win the Scottish Open, which I have money on Colin Morikawa at the Scottish Open, I'll take that money fine and have a worse number to probably bet him at at the Open Championship. But if he has a bad week at the Scottish, we're going to get a good number again on him. For whatever reason, out of all of the elite players, no one falls down the board quicker than he does, and I don't know why. We've got strokes gain data as well, Pat, from the last two Alfred Dunhill Lynx championships played here. So we haven't got it for the Opens, but it's just, it's just something to pitch, isn't it? So 2019, this is for the 36 holes they played on the old course. So these are old course specific strokes gain numbers. Victor Perez won. He was 12th for driving distance that week. First for off the tee. First for approach. First for tee to green. Danny Willett last year. 315 off the tee, so fourth off the tee. 33rd uh, in terms of distance, 33rd off the tee, fifth for approach, seventh for tee to green. So he he was top five for approach. Pat um, Victor Perez, not Pat Perez. Uh, Victor Perez was first for strokes gained on approach. So that that strokes gained approach angle screams Morikawa, doesn't it? It screams Will Zalatoris. Um, Cantlay can be he's the kind of guy that can just get around a golf course in multiple different ways, either a very, very hot putter or a great off the tee and an approach game. So, yeah, it's just, you know, if I was going to hone my skills or hone on to some skill sets here, longer than average off the tee, but as we've seen with Zach Johnson, that isn't, I remember 2015 vividly, all we kept talking about was bombers, 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 Zach Johnson wins. So, you know, power off the tee isn't absolutely everything, but I think... Uh, Longer the longer length off the tee than normal, but fantastic approach play. Fantastic approach play. And if we can get someone that's going to avoid those costly three putts as well, so that three putt avoidance statistic, something else to look into. I think that's going to pull a good short a short list together for next week. Well, I can start pumping those numbers into Fantasy National once I let you off the line and we can walk through it to see which names over time actually pop up. I want to recommend that everyone go check out at Bamford Golf on Twitter, the Golf Betting System Podcast. Uh, For the audio version, you can check out the YouTube version as well. Steve, thanks for jumping on, man. It's been a privilege to spend time with you, Pat. Well, I would feel 
very much the same way about you. Thank you so much. I love the content. I especially love the Euro content to go along with Sky and Tom's stuff. That is where I get most of my knowledge every single week. So once again, Golf <laughs> Betting System Podcast. Everyone, go check it out right now and at Bamford Golf on Twitter. But the time has come. FantasyNational.com slash Mayo gets you 20% off any membership. Let's go over there. Let's build the stats and see what we got cooking for the Open Championship. What I want to jump into first, however, is what we've seen at the past three Open Championships at St. Andrews. We'll open up Tiger Woods here. He's in the field already playing some of his practice rounds in Ireland with Rory Skip the Scottish Open. And it's uh, worth noting, I'll get to it in a second, about the weather splits that blindly weather stacking might turn into a real thing this week. If you click on over to, oh, there are the giveaways. You can just go sub to the newsletter right now. You can go click on the first post that's up there. Find all the giveaways, all the way to get into the ballots for the $500 giveaway, the Masters Polo giveaway. I've thrown on an annual membership to Fantasy National as well. You might want to skip over some of those Scottish Open stuff. One thing I was correct about, at least through day one, was just checking out the weather. The AM wave played significantly easier than the PM wave. And in the newsletter, I do have the wind tower that I'm using for St. Andrews. Obviously, we're too far out right now in order to really care about any of this stuff. We can drag it over and see what's going on. We're a ways out. You want to do this. I mean, it starts at like 2 o'clock in the morning, probably 2.15 a.m. Eastern time will be lock for the Open Championship. I mean, right now, no wind whatsoever on Thursday. On Friday, very little. On Saturday, very little. Okay, so right now, the Open Championship looks like it might be like minus 27. But we know that weather comes out of nowhere, as I discussed with Steve about the Open Championship. And when you just take a flyover of St. Andrews, you're just going to see that... It's completely exposed, so any bit of wind is going to be so impactful. So I would highly recommend going to WindFinder again, or even just going to the newsletter. You can go to the Open Championship Wind Tower, bookmark that for later in the season. I was a bit off on my, uh, oh, not completely off. I did not expect John Rahm to be the highest owned. I had him down at eighth highest owned, but he was the highest owned this week. Sometimes ownership guesses, uh, they're a bit tricky. So we'll click on Tiger Woods, and we'll go to the Open. And check out the 2015 stats on FantasyNational.com and just check out the leaderboard and see how people have done over the years. Frankly, I mean, it's not, it shouldn't be surprising, but at the home of golf, you have guys with a lot of staying power. Although you see like Jordan Nybruge is up there. He was like never heard from again after this tournament. But generally speaking, the cream really does rise to the top at St. Andrews. Most open championships, but this one in particular. And there's the Masters crossover, like guys with staying power who've been around for decades. So you might have to project that onto some of the younger players if you really do think that. But Zach Johnson, Louie, Leishman, Day, Jordan Spieth, they missed the playoff by just, I mean... Jordan Spieth missed that putt on the 71st hole. It was like an eight-footer for par, or else he would have been in there. And at least in the first round of the Scottish, he had those fescue greens figured out. So always watch out for Spieth and just his magic beans at a tournament like this with Link style play. So we'll dig more into the stats from this year in particular in a second. But I do want to look back at 2010 and 2005. Obviously, Louis was second in 2015. He won in 2010. And again, you can see up here, we have... Louis, Westwood, Stenson, like three guys with ultimate staying power. Westwood and Stenson, Rory, three players who have been ranked at number one in the world over the course of their career. Casey, I mean, Casey's never won a major, but another guy who's really good at Augusta National over the years. And even 10 years ago, he's still kicking. He just joined the Live Tour. Uh, so his days might be over for like high-end competitive golf, but it was over a decade run for Paul Casey of being like a top 25 player in the world. Goosen has two majors. You do have Robert Rock and Sean O'Hare. I mean, Watney was legit at one point injuries got the best of them but then you start seeing some of the other names i mean tom layman legend sergio legend sergio was even inside the top 10 in 2005 at st andrews as well obviously he's won at augusta national in the past funny to see jb holmes and charles schwartzel up there because when discussing the win stacks the year that stenson and phil ran away with it when it was just the two of them uh, jb holmes and charles were actually two of the players that were i think they came third and fourth that year at least they were both inside the top 10 I remember because 
because they started offering markets that did not include Stenson or Phil going into the final day <laughs> because, you know, they were no one was going to catch those guys. Dustin Johnson, Masters winner. Uh, he was leading after 36 holes in 2015 and then just completely fell off the face of the earth after the long delay. Kuchar, another guy with excellent Masters history. Adam Scott, obviously you know that he is a Masters champion. Kevin Na plays really well at the Masters too. Who else do we have here? Major winner Graham McDowell. I mean, Stephen Gallagher. I did bet on him at the Masters one time. I think it was like the first year we did the show. Not great news for Stephen Gallagher. Let's see, Tiger, Dick Fowler. Obviously, he's played well in Open Championships in the past. Having a decent go, at least through one round in Scotland at the moment. But he had one good round at J.P. McManus and then followed it up with a horrible round. Still came inside the top 10 at the Pro-Am, but you, you know what I'm saying. Who else do we have here? Trevor Immelman, Masters winner. Uh, Martin Keimer, you know, he has a top phase, a two-time major winner. So, like, legit names populate at St. Andrews, as we've seen. You know, Tiger, Monty, Couples, Alathabel, VJ Singh, Bernhard Langer, Retief Goosen. Those are all, I mean, Monty's not a major winner, but he was second at a lot of majors. All ma- Michael Campbell is a, is a major winner. And I believe he was in the final group with... Was it Savro? No, Rocco Constantino, the year that John Daly won in 1995. Michael Campbell was winning, I think, by three shots going into the final round, the year that Daly won, Uh, because I was watching the highlights of it the other day, and it had Constantino, Constantine, Constantino, totally forget what the dude's name is, the Italian guy. He was hugging Michael Campbell uh, when he made that miraculous putt on the 72nd hole before he lost in the four-hole aggregate playoff to John Daly, Ogilvy major winner. Sergio Garcia, major winner. Now, obviously, at the time in 2005, Sergio was not a major winner. I don't think Jeff Ogilvy was either. Or was that 2000? He won the field. I think that was 2006 that he ended up winning. <coughs> Other than that, Faldo, major winner. Uh, Graham McDowell, major winner. So these guys are up there. John Daly, even. Even in 2005, he came T15. He is a major winner. Darren Clark didn't get his until years later at the Open Championship, but still, major winner. So... It's going to be tough trying to find the sleepers this week is really what I'm getting at of, you know, maybe you can project out into the future the guys that you want to have up there, but, you know, the class is going to rise even in the bad wind conditions. It's going to kill a couple guys who are really good. That we know. But when we just go back and look at the end of the week, it's going to be the guys that you would expect to be there. So let's take a look at the past five years. At the Open Championship, obviously different locations, but similar styles of courses. Uh, Port Rush was a little bit different, but even that had inclement weather as well. And it just, it's par for the course. I mean, the year that Rory won, it feels like, I think he won at like minus five or minus six. I just remember in the first round, he was the first round leader, went out and just tuned everyone uh, and then just held on the rest of the week. So you need, it, it's a mix of two things. I mean, the skill element of why you see so many great players at the top of Open Championship leaderboards really kind of delves into what we're looking at in terms of being able to hold on, not turning bogeys into double bogeys or triple bogeys or pars into bogeys. Like when we go back and look through the stats from 2015, we're really going to find out that, you know, double bogey avoidance was really the linchpin in not having just complete blowups and finding yourself near the top of the leaderboard. I know that goes hand in hand and that's really hard to predict, but generally speaking, better players end up doing that. That's where they salvage their rounds and you do need the ability. It's a combo that if the weather is down, you need to take advantage and start making birdies in a hurra because if you don't pile them up when the conditions are easy, these holes aren't all that hard. Like I said, if there's no wind, if the wind projects like we just saw a week out in advance, which it will not remain that way, considering the Scottish Open forecast changed like five times on the 12 hours leading up to tee off. Uh, so check it all the way up until lock to make sure that you can squeeze out any advantage that you can get. And the wind can change so frequently at a course like this and change directions that even if one side looks great, play both sides, honestly. Like if you're playing 50 lineups and you want to do like 30 a.m. p.m. because that's the way that it looks, I would recommend 10 to 15 the other way at p.m. a.m. You might be lighting those you might be lighting that on fire in terms of your investment into DraftKings that week, but if everything flips, because if there does look to be a distinctive wave advantage, then everyone is going to jump on it. And when I say everyone, I mean like 5 to 10% of the field, and a lot of those people are going to be mass multi-entering that. So they're playing 150 lineups, and they're stacking like 125 AM, PM. But to do it the other way, you're really only competing with like less than 1%, and we see weather change enough that the probability of the weather 
interchanging and that being the correct wave, or at least it's just being equal. Now you have contrarian players from that wave. All of a sudden, it's probably at a more than 1% chance of happening. Put it that way. God, we've just seen it way too many times. So if we look back the past five years, Open Championship, here's what we got going. Spieth is your best player, has not finished outside of the top 30 in any of the past five years. Obviously, it was T4, missed the playoff by a stroke in 2015. Stenson, Finau, Rory, Brooks, Justin Rose, Tommy Fleetwood, Webb Simpson, Xander Shoffley, Francesco Molinari, Zach Johnson, weirdly, got cut one of those years, did not play in 2021, and his win isn't included during this overall strokes gain total, but he had three top 20s before that, so interesting to see with Zach Johnson, obviously he's getting up there in age, but Duke can still flick a wedge and Sometimes that all, that's all it takes. That's all he had to do in 2015 and make that huge putt on the 72nd hole. DJ Sergio Lowry. Lowry's a really interesting one uh, when you look at the trend lines. Those are all the players who have over just a, a summation of over 20 total strokes gained on the field over the past five years. Bobby Mack is just after that and only two appearances. Two top two appearances at the Open Championship. Robert McIntyre, two top tens at the Open Championship. Then it's like Hatton, Patrick Reed. John Rom, Danny Willett, Colin Morikawa in one appearance uh, was able to pull it out. It's funny to see like Louis is not up there because obviously we know his track record at. I, I like Louis to win this week. I'm going to wait for the odds to drop a little bit. But yeah, 2017, 2016, he missed the cut after losing in the playoff in 2015. But three top 30s after that, a T3 a year ago. Obviously in a lot better form a year ago coming in. But he has two top 10s on the Live Tour since he joined the Live Tour and a top 10 over in the DP World Tour in Germany as well before we jumped into everything. I really like him, especially, I'll dig into this more on the next show with Raza and Tambo. I just feel like at $8,800, that's a really good price to make Louis a very good contrarian play. Just when you look at the DraftKings pricing this week, like the other names are just so obvious. Like if I mean, Burns, let's say he has a good week in Scotland, he's going to be very popular. Everyone's going to be off of Hovland now because he had a bad round one and if he misses the cut, people will be off. <coughs> but just some of the guys in the lower tier, like people will look at course history with Finau, and now he's cheaper. So 8400 bucks coming in. Connors, if he has a good week. Neiman, if he has a good week. Like We always see a lot of gravitation towards the low eights and high sevens for in majors, just because it, the, the pricing is a little bit softer uh, in this regard. So, like, if Homa has a good week, obviously Berger didn't play in Scotland, but he had a top 10 last year at the Open Championship. Someone who has struggled at Augusta throughout the course of his career, by the way. Uh, no one's going to use Bryson. Just I mean, He's never played well at the Open Championship, and since he became big, beefy Bryson, has never played well at the Masters either. No one likes him, so no one's going to use him. Uh, Connors is somewhat interesting, though. I, it feels like he's a little bit overpriced at $8,200, although I think that people might might get the net, as they say, from the early 1990s. Well, when did Wayne's World come out? 91? Yeah, get the net. Corey Connors, $8,200, a very strong play next week. Obviously, he has the Masters history, which is immaculate for someone who can't chip or putt. T15 last year at the Open Championship. I really like him a lot at $8,200. Obviously, I like Louis a lot at 88 That's where I'm going to pivot off a little bit. I would assume he's like half the ownership of Burns, maybe a third of Burns. And then everyone else in that range, like Brooks is not going to be very highly owned. Fleetwood, who knows? Hatton, who knows? A lot of that, I think, will depend on their finish at the Scottish Open when we start digging into it a little bit more. But those are the guys uh, who's been bad at the Open Open Championship, who's good. Obviously, all the old dudes. Billy Ho has been a train wreck at the Open Championship, which is funny because I, he won at Wentworth last year in England for the BMW PGA Championship, the fled, the Players' Championship of the DP World Tour. But that's like a tree-lined parkland course. It's not a link style course. So don't conflate that with what's going to happen at the Open Championship. You got Daly, Higo, that's only one start. Burns in one start. He did make the cut. It just didn't turn out all that great. Top 65 and ties make the cut in the field of 156 next week. So that's different from the Open, from the U.S. Open, where it was top 60 and ties, top 65 this week, and no MDF uh, because it is a major. Bryson's down on that list. 
just trying to find guys who have played in a bunch. Burn Wiesberger, uh, he's on the Live Tour now, but even at the Open Championship has not really churned out very many quality results. Answer in Neiman. I'm surprised about Neiman. I actually like Neiman next week. Going to throw him on the short list at $8,000 as well. I just like anytime you can crank up the wind machine to 11, it just feels like Neiman has those shots, those low ball flight shots. He can cut it through the wind. We've seen him perform well in windier conditions in the past. So, I mean, it's two appearances for him trying to get like more of a, a baseline here obviously Harrington has won the open championship twice uh just won the senior U.S. Open so maybe he's reinvigorated a little bit did have a top 10 or top 5 finish actually at the PGA championship last year too so wouldn't overlook Patty at $6,700 feels like he's priced up a bit weirdly enough uh versus some of the other options some of the more younger players bunch of first timers in the open championship as you can see uh, Cam Smith is weirdly low on this list. Uh, never better than T20 in any of the past five years, but you know, he plays pretty well at Augusta National. Maybe St. Andrews is the course where we really need to be. Did he play in 2015? I have no idea if he was like kicking in 2015. The first time I remember him is Chambers Bay, so... I don't know why it happened in 2015. The Open Championship. No, he did not play in the Open Championship in 2015. Chambers Bay is really where I remember him in his like coming out party. Yeah, there it is in 2015. Surprised they didn't get into. That's strange. He didn't get into the Open Championship with the top five at the U.S. Open. Was everything backwards then? Am I am I taking crazy pills here? Is that is that what's happening? Let's see, he was they miss he made the cut of the U.S. Open the following year. Let's see. Yeah, no, he didn't play. Was the schedule different then? No, it looks like he either like, got hurt or took a month off or something like that because he didn't play between the Travelers and the PGA Championship, which is strange. Uh, but I, it would be strange if you weren't if you were eligible to play at St Andrews and decided to skip it to focus on the PGA Championship. Either way, uh, Cameron Smith should be pretty good uh, for this event. Hideki not the most success actually at the Open Championships over the years. You see Connors down there; that's two starts, but he does have a top fifteen finish. Mixing it out, uh, Kokrak, or for sorry, Fratelli. I forgot Fratelli was in the mix last year. Two cuts made for Kokrak. He's obviously a different player at this point, even from a year ago. He's a little bit different. Ryan Fox, everyone's favorite Ryan Fox. What does the Fox say? He says three consecutive cuts made at this event at $7,100. Even if he has a bad week at the Scottish, I would still expect him to be one of the more popular plays in that range. You can see, well, Woodland's having at least a good opening round. I Again, it's almost like Neiman in a weird way that I always felt like Gary Woodland would have really made an excellent open championship player with the ball flight that he has, his ability to play hard course as well. And when the weather gets really bad that you can kind of jump on it. But as Tambo made the point, Gary Woodland is like the amorphous player of no matter what the course is, you can kind of make a case where it's like, oh, bomber's track. Oh, Gary Woodland time. Oh, it's really windy. Great for Gary Woodland. He can club down and use that stinger and cut it through. He's at, he's at least at, in better form at the moment than anything else. But this entire range looks kind of wonky, doesn't it? Mito, I, I can see Mito playing well at the Open Championship. But Zayden has actually had a few good runs at the Masters in the past. Um, other than that, I mean, Willits won the Masters, and he's made the cut each of the past, geez, and he, we saw him pop up there, too, in 2015 at the Open Championship at St. Andrews. I think that's six consecutive cuts made at $7,000. Again, he's another player who's just very adept at scrambling, plays better on Lynx courses than anything else. He even won the Alfred Dunhill Championship a year ago, as Steve pointed out, with two courses, with two rounds at St. Andrews. So you know, don't be sleeping on my boy Danny Willett. Maybe it's time for him to cash us another 150 to one major championship ticket. I don't know if I'll get there, but it would be very nice. He, he's always going to be in my heart uh, when it comes to going down the road for Mr. Danny Willett. His success is always my success because even if he wins and I don't bet him, people still give me credit for it. It's a great place to be in overall. Who is down here that's actually pretty good? Zach Johnson at 65 is somewhat interesting. See how Zanotti holds up in Scotland. Was good in Ireland, decent in Scotland. If he can churn out a decent week, uh, I bet him top 30. So that's probably just a losing bet. So we'll see how that ends up going. Where's our boy Tom Kim? Tom Kim, bogey free round. Uh, the first round at the Scottish Open. Okay, now we got to find where Tom Kim is at. What is he priced as? Even in the field, there he is. $6,500. We're going to throw Jun, Ju Hun, a.k.a. Tom Kim into the mix and just take a look at tom kim for a second 23rd at the u.s open missed the cut at the pga championship was top 20 at the byron nelson yeah that's a pretty good run for tom kim and started out with 
pretty good fire, uh, at least so far, at the Scottish Open. Let's just take a look if he's been playing overseas at all. I don't know if he has been. Uh, maybe he has been. I don't know. That's why I'm going to go check. Let's see. He was, yeah, 23rd. Oh, yeah, he went over to the International Series for the Asian Tour in England. Uh, ended up coming T5 that week. Uh, and even before that, the Asian Korean Tour top five on the Asian Tour, just a bunch of top fives before coming over. But he's a real player. He really is. And sixty five hundred dollars, I could see him amongst the community of people who talk about golf, look at golf stats, bet on golf. I have a feeling that Tom Kim is going to be a pretty popular selection. If that those are the builds that you want to have this week, uh, it, it's probably unnecessary to go down to sixty five hundred dollars. But if you wanted to make like a Rory Spieth lineup or Scheffler and Morikawa. Morikawa, Spieth, and Cameron Smith, some combination of these top-end guys, then you're going to have to drop down and take one of these 6K guys, and Tom Kim is going to be a pretty attractive option at $6,500. Is Brennan Grace in the field? Not as of yet. He can still play himself in with a good run. I guess that's why he ended up joining the Scottish Open. Got the live exemption over at the Scottish Open and tried it out. So when I was looking back at 2015, in the St. And the last time I was at St. Andrews, obviously I've been through who won three man playoff. ZJ, if you gotta if you gotta ask how much, you can't afford it, pal. Louis Leishman, that was the playoff. Then you had Day, who's not qualified, I don't think. And then Spieth, then Nybruge, Danny Willett, obviously sixth. Uh, Justin Rose, Sergio, Adam Scott, Brooks that year, top 10. That was before Brooks really became Brooks. And oh, maybe this is a happy place for Brooks. A guy who's played Augusta pretty well when he's not injured over the years. Oh my God, Ollie Schneider chance. Here we go. This is the one I wanted to go to though. Uh, fairways gained, driving distance. So obviously Zach loses a bunch to the field. So does Jordan Spieth. Nybruge about breaks even. Sergio actually loses to the field very marginally in terms of driving distance. However, when you sort by driving distance and look at the top, you do notice something. The guys who led in driving distance that week, 4th, 2nd, 6th, 10th, 10th. You'd be surprised how much driving distance matters at the Open Championship, especially if the wind ends up down. I mean, there's a reason that, I mean, Tiger's a great player. Is he, in my lifetime, there's going to be no one better, and he's, what, one of the two best players of all time. But so much of his advantage, especially in, like, the late 90s, early 2000s, was just how much farther he hit the ball than everyone. Then that stopped being the case once everyone went on the Tiger plane and learned how to hit the ball a ton. But, I mean, you can even see Louie that week, second in driving distance. Jason Day, first. You don't think of these guys necessarily as bombers anymore, but in 2015, you know, they had a bit, Justin Rose had a bit more oomph in the tank. Uh, Adam Scott and uh, Brooke Koepka are still up there. Now, it's not the end-all be-all, because you see, like, Dillette uh, and Gary Woodland, you know, they both finished outside the top 55. They were next on the list. My boy Dillette, he just retired. Shout out Graham Dillette, love ya. DJ was the 36-hole leader. Oh my god, Stephen Bowditch made the cut? Ollie is up there. So you have a bunch of t Grace was T20. Russell Henley was T20. And if it is windy or burnt out, you're going to get a lot more roll on that. Even Leishman uh, was up there in terms of driving distance. <coughs> so if we do a reverse sort and see how guys did uh, who lost the field in driving distance, Todd was the best one. I assume he just uh, he gained on the field in greens and regulation. I assumed a lot of his success was putting throughout the course of the week, uh, but you're going to have to make it up. Like, if you're not a big hitter, you're going to have to make it up with wedges and putting in short game. Like, that's, and that's really difficult to prognosticate. One good thing about driving distance that comes into it is driving distance is about the most predictable thing that you can find on the PGA Tour when we're putting this out. Whether it's, I mean, strokes gained approach, it's the most important stat. It's not the most predictable stat in the world. Some guys go, like, you want the consistent guys and hopefully get a spike week, but guys who are, like, mediocre with the irons can have a really great week. We saw with Denny McCarthy at the U.S. Open. And then he went back to being Denny McCarthy again and couldn't hit his irons anymore. Uh, it's not as capricious as putting in terms of trying to really project it out. And around the green, I mean, that's very dependent on the course. It's very dependent on the rough. As Bamford pointed out earlier, like you can take the Texas wedge. You can putt off these greens if you wanted to. I mean, it's not for everyone, but for the really bad putters of the world or really bad chippers of the world, guys like Victor Hovland or even Martin Keimer uh, that we saw do that, as he mentioned, at Pinehurst. Anytime that you can get Martin Keimer at a course where he can putt from off the greens, his chances get significantly better because dude cannot chip to save his life. 
See, Marcus Frazier and James Morrison are up there. Anthony Wall, like guys that you wouldn't expect to be up here. They did it without distance. So obviously they ran hot doing something else throughout the course of the week. Spieth was down there, but you can see he gained on the field of fairways. He gained in good drives. He was he number one in greens and regulation for the week. Spieth really should have won. Actually, Brooks was. Brooks, Louie, Ricky, Burned, Thomas Aiken. So you see where the three putt percentage is really going to start gobbling up these guys. They just weren't good at it. And maybe that's been the problem for Burn Wiesberger at the Open Championship over the years. Is just three putt avoidance on these giant greens where you might be putting from 125 feet is just not good. Uh, and you can see some of the other guys who pop up there who like that. I mean, Cameron Tringali huh? wasn't really much of a problem for him around one at the Scottish Open. We'll see how that turns out. But in terms of greens and regulation, if you see high greens and regulation at the Open Championship and not near the top of the leaderboard, you can guess lag putting was a huge factor in all of that. Uh, there's 14 par fours this week. And we'll just sort by who played the par fours the best. Um, all the guys at the very top of the leaderboard. So we're going to really factor that in into the very rudimentary model, which I do want to get to right now. And it's not super in-depth. I'm going to try to add some to the newsletter throughout the course of the week. But I don't want to bog down this show too, too much with it. I actually already put it out. Or actually, I already comprised it. We'll go click on it right now. And it's a lot of the it's a lot different than the models that I normally use. Just for St. Andrews 2020, what are we looking at here? Uh, I could probably throw in some other things as well. I'm going to ratchet down par four strokes gained by 5%. And I'm going to throw in proximity because we don't have strokes gained data, like legit strokes gained data from all these years at St. Andrews. It's a lot of guesswork of where guys end up. But I'm going to guess 125 to 150 or 100 to 125. You can kind of pick your poison. You can run it both ways. You can add them both if you want to. But I'm just going to take a look at 100 to 125. Actually, 125 to 150. Because uh, you're going to get a lot of substantial rollout on these greens. And we'll weight that at 5%. So what I have is bogey avoidance, uh, 15%. I actually did want to click back on that for a second. Where are we at? Birdies, bogeys gained. Uh, doubles avoided. Uh, those are also all the guys at the very top of the leaderboard. <laughs> I mean, that makes a lot of sense. You're not making double bogeys. Of course, your score is going to be better. But just it's crazy to think that like th this is where the big separation was amongst all those guys. And there's one noticeable name missing from this list. And it's probably what ended up doing him in by the end of it. Uh, you see Jordan Spieth was about even with the field in doubles avoided. He just made too many. N only Ollie Schneider, Jansen, Ash Ashley Chesters were the only two inside of the top 12 who actually lost strokes to the field in doubles gained and then you'd have to go down to t30 in jimmy or t20 uh, t20 uh, the guys who tied for like 29th and 28th henley and harrington were the two who also dropped to the field in that bogey's avoided was a bit of a you know, different one you just don't want to avoid those blow up holes but i did want to throw this up here as well because you do see the very top of the leaderboard inside top 20 i, I normally don't like putting these stats inside of a model essentially because I think that these are storytelling stats. It's a lot like war in baseball. It just tells you guys that have been good. And that's the summation of the stats that go into telling you how good of a player was. It's not predictive in any sort of way. You'd be like, oh yeah, that guy was good over this period of time. This is what it equaled. And bogey avoidance kind of goes into that. But it does put in scrambling. It does put in whatever. Uh, so maybe we'll try to use it here. I just want to use it as just to hit on the things that Steve and I talked about as what we think are important. And maybe you think other stuff is important. And listen, I'm wrong all the time. You might be correct. But this is one of the advantages of Fantasy National is it allows you to do your research, do your own research. I mean, that's what the internet's all about these days. You do your own research for vaccines, you might as well do it for golf, right? FantasyNational.com slash Mayo to get that 20% off and go do this yourself and try to find that secret edge that isn't there. But overall, bogey avoidance 15, driving distance 20, par 4 gained 20%. Putting from over 25 feet, 10%. More on that in a second. Three-putt avoidance, 10%. So I kind of put separated lag putting because lag putting isn't a real stat. Drew Matthews actually does have some lag putting. I think he has the Spectrum shot-by-shot shot data, and he is working on that. Uh, so if you want to go hit up Drew, I think Skylar Hoke, who hosts the DP World Tour Picks and Bet Show on Mayo Media Network, subscribe now. By the way, get that ballot. I think that's five ballots into the $500 draw, so you might as well do that if you're watching this or even listening to the podcast. Go sub on YouTube. Help us out over there. Uh, but I think he has more comprehensive lag putting data. I would like to see from 50+, plus. tell you the truth. But where we get ours from ShotLink... Uh, this is just the highest category that they have. So I have to go over 25 feet. 
Strokes gained approach, 20%, and proximity, 125 to 155%. Over the past 50 rounds, let's see who this pumps out. Maybe we have a sleeper too. I'm going to guess it tells us the best players have been the best players because these are pretty comprehensive stats uh, that we're getting to here in terms of like just very generic great ones. Oh, who's that? Paul Casey, number one in approach. He hasn't played in a while, though. Uh, so the overall ranks, top 10. Thomas Scheffler, Finau, Rom Zalatoris, Sam Burns, Rory McIlroy, Shane Lowry, Xander Shoffley, and Cameron Smith. The only thing that Shane Lowry has not really been good at is right there. The proximity is still 56. It's a big field, though. You can see John Rahm has been bad from that range as well. Uh, Zalo Torres has not been great from that range. But they also hit it a lot longer. So maybe they're the 100 to 125 bucket. It's not a catch-all in terms of bucket. That's just what I am happen to be using for this particular run in the model. Rory, here's what's really interesting. Not bad, like a better than average at putting from outside of 25 feet. Three putt avoidance bad. 91st. Not great from in close. So will that be the Achilles heel for Rory? Because he's really figured out his wedge game. That was on display in Canada like no other. I'm going to continue to beat the drum on the national open swing. I mean, it's already the Rolex series on the DP World Tour. We're co-sanctioning events. Like, why don't we just bump the Canadian Open till the week after the U.S. Open or keep it before, add that German event in the place of the Travelers, and then you can go Canadian Open, U.S. Open, German Open, Irish Open, Scottish Open, British Open. And you can have some sort of, mega, I know two majors are in there as well, but have some sort of mega prize for the national championship swing. That's cool. I like that. I'd be all over it because the national championship, the passion that you see on the grounds from the spectators are so awesome that I'd just be all about it. Uh, the trend lines for Shane Lowry actually work out really well. Uh, I'll get to some trends here in a second that I have rigged up for you, but the miscut at the U.S. Open is somewhat worrying, although he was pretty good at the Irish. He was inside the top 10. But other than that, like, just look at these results coming in. It's fantastic. And obviously, he has pretty good Open Championship history. He has won a Claret Jug. He's the longest reigning champion golfer of the year. Uh, just because, you know, the COVID year. There was no there was no 2020 U.S. Open. But first and 12th in the last two. Missed the cut back in the day at St. Andrews. Uh, he had a bad run at the Open Championship. But he's just a much better player these days. And obviously, we know he's very good in the wind. It's funny that, like, he was so good with the putter. And that's really let him down recently. In Canada, at the U.S. Open, and in Ireland, he was one of the tops tee to green. And he was one of the not low on the green with the flat stick in his hand. So who are some other guys that kind of pop up here? in terms of how we're looking at the overall results. Uh, you have Keegan, Hideki, Scott, Seamus Power, number 15. Okay, that's probably the first guy down the board, although Scott is $7,700. How has Adam Scott been playing? It feels like his stats are always better than his results. Yeah, the results really haven't been there. Fourth at Genesis, fifth at the CJ Cup. That's going back to last November. 14th at the U.S. Open. That ain't bad. Memorial, that was, that was a tough scene for him. So I'm not, I'm not going to bet Adam Scott to win, put it that way is what I, the conclusion that I'm coming to. DraftKings-wise, 77. I think there are better options, but 7,400. Mito at 73. Rates out inside the top 20 at the same time. You have Gary Woodland at $7,100, and this doesn't include anything he's done at the Scottish Open. These numbers look pretty good, right? And this is over the 50 rounds. That's in the longer form. We can go 100 rounds. Maybe that's uh, an angle that we want to play, or you want to shrink it down to see who comes in with the hot fire recently. Maybe we'll try to look at those at the same time. Uh, we can do the rolling report and kind of really hammer down on it. Who else do we have here inside the top 50? Uh, Hao Tong is 50th. He is $6,900. Don't mind me some Hao Tong. I know he had the great run the year. Who the hell won that year? He and Grace had the great runs uh, on the Saturday. Yeah, it was 2017. I think that's the year that Spieth won at Burkdale, beating oh, my poor Matt Kuchar bet. That poor delay in Kuchar eating the sandwich and Spieth taking 25 minutes to hit the ball and then just made every putt ever after that. But how Tong and Grace? So he has a third at the Open Championship. He's someone who's played well at majors in the past, and it does seem like he's gotten his game back together, just won in Munich. So we'll see how he does at the Scottish to follow it up. Uh, Hoagie and Na, I don't know how much I love those guys. The approach, especially the wedges for Na, are really good. Uh, it's a tough scene, though, with him. Rose, I mean, you're always going to get your old men 
who are up the, near the top. The driving distance, funny how he came. I think he was second the year that we looked at in 2015, or inside the top five. Now he's 93rd coming into this event. But you can see the beyond 25-foot putting, very good. Very good at bogey avoidance. He's one of the top 10 players in the field over the past 50 rounds from 125 to 150. That's more of his you know, good range. And he's still a pretty good scrambler, avoiding bogeys. You know, he's 58th in the field. That's better than average. So, I mean, Justin Rose as an old man, I can get behind it. Why not? Uh, I'm playing Spieth next week. Nothing will talk me out of playing Spieth next week. And if he wants to shoot like 85 over, I'm going to have to live with the results. But just play Spieth at the Open. Play Spieth at Augusta. Play Spieth at the Open Championship. Those are the two things that you want to do. I don't think I'm going to get there with a bet with Spieth to win. But DraftKings-wise, I think that he's very, very solid. Uh, and he can win, for sure. But I don't know if I want to bet him at like 18 to 1 at this point. So let's just take a look uh, again on the longer term. Par 4 scoring. If there's any sort of outliers there, Cam Young's got a case of the it going bad at the moment for him. He was so good. Uh, even in the round one at the Scottish, he was really bad. And you can see, it all fell apart for him at the Memorial. He had this amazing run on the grow, go, obviously third, second, third at the PGA Championship. He was right there. And let's look at what happened to old Cameron Young at Memorial. It was going pretty well. 67, 71, 73, 84. 84 in the final round, the wheels came off for him. And then he goes to the U.S. Open. He's kind of a disaster. He was a disaster in round one. I mean, he made, he almost made one of the all time greatest runs to make the cut at the U.S. Open, which included a hole in one. But he made like five birdies in a row with a hole in one in there and still didn't make the cut. He got to the number and then the number moved on him. Uh, and he's off to a putrid start at the Scottish Open. So I don't know if there's anything wrong with him, but his ownership will be way down on DraftKings now because all of this, uh, just the recent run that he's in. I don't know if we want to go there, but longer term, the numbers do like him. Not great from in close, but he has all of the other kind of key metrics that you would want to see. Uh, the three-putt avoidance isn't all that good. Who else do we have from down here? Shockingly enough, the players that play the power fours the best on the PGA Tour are the best players. Keegan keeps showing. Seamus keeps showing. There's Corey Connors. He, he's entered the conversation. Having any sort of putting in the modeling is going to hurt him, obviously. What else? Finau, Louis, JT Poston. And that's over 50 rounds. That's just not the past five rounds when he's been hot fire. Uh, it has been over the past 50 rounds. Burns, Mito still up there. Hovland, Rose still plays the par fours really, really well. Uh, Morikawa, Killikeen. I don't know who Stephen Dodd is, but apparently he's in this field. And he has four weighted rounds going into it. So these are some of the different angles we can look at this week. If we did want to look at bogey avoidance, uh, Fitz, Lowry, Sungjae, Rory, and then Justin Thomas. Scheffler, eh, wasn't so much the case round one in Scotland. Now, was it Scotty? Kill it. Somehow, Scotty Scheffler is the one killing my AM, PM stacks at the Scottish Open. Uh, hopefully, he can rebound in the win. Maybe that's his more of his scene on Friday. Tony Finau, John Rahm, Seamus Power again up to me. I got to add Seamus Power. Got to add him. He's just, he, he, I, I can't not listen to the numbers they're telling me. They're telling me Bezaden how it is well. Which actually does make sense. Someone who's played how I know he had the one good year at Augusta National. He's someone who plays hard courses relatively well. He keeps trading like good performance with bad performances, and obviously I don't know how he's going to finish at the Scottish Open. Never better than fifty third in an Open Championship at the Masters. He's made the cut all three times. Nothing better than T thirty eight. So yeah, that makes it easy for me to just you know X players out of my player pool. That's what we need to do at this point. No idea where Gooch is. If you thought the Live Tour was like the Ryder Cup, well, well welcome to the home of golf and to see how fired up people get. First in three putt avoidance, however, but bad at putting from outside of twenty five feet. So uh, he's not leaving it close on the longer putts, but he's at least making the second putt, which is kind of huge, right? Uh, but, you know, very up there in bogey avoidance, you can tell. I mean, a lot of the good short putters, it's funny that Zalatoris is up there, just how three putt avoidance, 30th, putting from outside 25 feet, 35th. It's just funny to think of. He just misses a lot of five foot birdie putts is what really kills Will Zalatoris. But uh, he is Anderkers. That's the one thing that we do know. Uh, I don't know if that will keep me off him for DraftKings, but he ain't getting my money in the outright betting market. Can't do it. Well, there's, there's, there's our guy, Oliver Fair, Keith Mitchell. No one from the sixes is down here besides Keith Mitchell in terms of bogey avoidance. Chris Kirk, 68, is up there. Howe Tong, 69. Mackenzie Hughes, 68. Dietry, 66. Uh, but Dietry doesn't have the full complement around. Three-putt avoidance. Gooch, Thomas, Hatton, Kokrak, Shoffley, Lucas Herbert. 
Interesting with Herbert. I like Cam Smith. I'm going to throw Cam Smith onto the list too, just with the Masters crossover. Uh, we'll get to Masters stats in a second, but I did want to do the rolling report for a minute just to see guys that are potentially trending up with these stats or trending down with these stats as well. So rolling report, custom model, and we'll take a look from the past four to 100 rounds. Well, this loads. I want to recommend again, you smash the like button. If you sub to the newsletter, you can find all of the giveaways with the rating and reviews, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, five stars, Twitter handle or email address, something you like about the show to get into that draw for the $500 straight cash, the Fantasy National membership, the Augusta National Masters Polo directly from the course. Those are the three big giveaways right now, but we're not afraid to... uh Really throw some more into the mix if enough people do it. And in the newsletter, there's the special ballot stuffer. Uh, you can just see it up there right now. Just go click on the first one that's up there. Uh, don't, I don't, wouldn't recommend following some of those bets from the Scottish Open, but you can find the giveaways. I mean, that, that, it's a no risk to you guys uh, in order to do it. And you'll get a match deposit on as, as well. So you can try it out if it's available in your state. So please help us out by going to do that. It means a lot to the show uh, by doing that particular one inside of the newsletter. Keep it secret for now. So this is the rolling report of what we're looking at here. So past 100 rounds, the longest term we're going to look at, Thomas Zalatoris, Xander, Casey, Hovland, Rom, Scheffler, Tiger, Colin Morikawa, Keegan Bradley. That's the top 10. You got Rory, DJ, Sam Burns. No one really outlier-ish on this list. Berger is the cheapest guy inside the top 20, except for Mito Pereira. So at the bottom, you have Mito, Corey Connors. Then you have Russell Henley, who the stats always love. He's down at $7,200. But those are names that you would fully expect. I don't know what's going on with Harold Werner III. He withdrew from the Scottish Open before it began. It looks like he's still going to be fine. Don't really know where his head is at or his back is at or whatever wrong with him at the moment. Uh, Woodland, even long-term, is 29th on this list. Neiman is 31st. Arnas is 33rd over the past 100 rounds. I don't think he has 100 rounds. Seamus Power is still 32nd over the past 100. He hasn't dipped below 54th in any one key metric. That is 24th in the power rankings from the past 24 rounds. He's been better since over the past 12, 28, past 9, 19th. So you can see Hatton's in the opposite direction. If you go from 100 down to 12th, I mean, Hatton drops to 79th. Uh, Brooks Kepka drops from 28th to 64th. There were some other big droppers over that time. Tiger Woods, 8th to 70th. Man, that makes a lot of sense. Hovland, 5th to 45th. Everyone else is, I mean, not necessarily directly at their baseline. Like, Berger's at 35th, short-term, long-term, 16th. See if we can find any big discrepancies, too. Uh, Woodland has been worse lately, but obviously he's starting to ratchet it back up again. Had a really good U.S. Open, uh, where there's no strokes gain stats. Having a good Scottish Open, where we don't have the stats incorporated into this yet. So you know, maybe the stats won't tell the entire story on old Gary Woodland. But long term, he looks good. He's going on the list. Boom. Another And a guy is a major winner. So that does mean something. When we went back and looked at those leaderboards, why we went and did it. Uh, Thomas Peters falls way down the list. Sung J.M. goes way up the list from 45th to 16th. So let's look at past 12. Most recent form, and obviously, again, the U.S. Open is not factored into this because there's no shot link strokes gain data. So you have to. that's the one problem with the shorter term stuff that at certain stats that you look at, like it's incorporated into terms of driving distance and bogey avoidance, but no strokes gained approach, for example, on things like this. So some of it's included, some of it's not, only what we actually have the data on uh, long-term with it. So Rory is number one short-term. Who are some big, big jumpers here? It's all like basically the same guys. Connors goes from 20th to 10th. Here's one, JT Post in 132nd to 20th. <coughs> It's pretty good for JT Post. Now, a lot of that's from the Travelers and John Deere over the past. Those are five of the past 12 rounds that he's played. He's been lights out over that time. Morikawa, you know, he's still inside the top 20 despite how poorly he's playing. So got to watch out for that. Cameron Young actually falls down the list a little bit, which I found somewhat surprising. Who else do we have here? John Rahm goes from 6th to 32nd. Berger, 16th to 31st. Big jumper is Patty Harrington, 131st to 36th. Okay. Uh, Francesco Molinari, 77th to 38th. Big follower in Victor Hovland. There's some red numbers here. Uh, here's a jumper, Justin Harding, who actually had a very good day. He's on the live tour now, but very good day at the Scottish Open. Open with a five under, 121 to 60th. And I know that he actually earned a repeat performance at the Masters. 
And that was mainly based on putting. That's going to be his entire game. Yeah, so he has a 12th and a missed cut at the Masters in his career. Pretty decent player, the South African. Teh, the Open. Uh, two cuts made. Top 20 last year at the Open Championship. So interesting on Justin Harding. He has eighty sixty eight hundred dollars You can see that Bobby Mack gets a little bit better over that time frame. Uh, Wyndham Clark goes up. Tiger goes way down. How Tong is about the same, like in the middle of the pack. Kevin Kisner getting a little bit better recently. Jimmy Walker getting a little bit better recently. Nothing marginal. These are all guys outside the top 70 in the overall rankings over the past 12 rounds. If that's what we want to really focus in on, well, it's just been bad overall. But again, uh, the DP World Tour stats aren't factored into this either. So for the Europeans, it can be kind of a crapshoot with a lot of this stuff. So that's really what I wanted to look at in terms of everything. We're going to look at past 24 rounds. And we're only going to look at Augusta National and try to see if there is anyone that maybe we've forgotten about that actually plays pretty well at Augusta National. So let's, let's try to find it out here. Obviously, we only have strokes gain total, and we're going to go by average just to see per year. Maybe we can find, we can weed out some guys. Zalatoris is number one. Zalatoris, DJ Scheffler, Rom, Rory Thomas, no big surprises. Matsuyama, Rose is still up there. Cam Smith, Spieth, Finau, Connors, Morikawa, Bobby Mack, Gooch, Minwooly. Maybe Gooch is a play. People won't use him because of his stupid comments and being on the live tour, but I'm going to throw him on the tentative list of guys I want to do some more research on. So who are some guys that would be surprising on this list? Yeah, Leishman's been pretty good. And he came second to St. Andrews last time around. I know the form isn't really there on Leishman at the moment, but uh, maybe. Miscut, 14th at the U.S. Open. Miscut, 34th at the PGA Championship. He, at least he's made the cut at all three majors. That's a start. I mean, it's not nothing. Lee Westwood, Poulter, Henley, Paul Lowry. Oh, God. When are, the, when are those from? Like 89 years ago? Shane Lowry. Shane Lowry has not been the best. That That is a very fair for Shane Lowry. Uh, he was good this year at the Masters. Obviously, no one was really going to catch Scheffler, but let's see where he's. Yeah, he was third at the Masters this year. That run is really impeccable. And that's what I want to close with here is trends, trend lines. And you can read all of these in, I think I'm going to include them in the Sunday newsletter. So if you just want to jump over to there, go sub to it right now, get some ballots in that draw. Uh, 2001, there were 10 qualified players to cash top 10 checks at the 2021 Open Championship. Those players were... Let's see here. Um, obviously, we have Colin Morikawa, Jordan Spieth, John Rahm, Louis Ustase, and Dylan Hot Fire for Telly, Mackenzie Hughes, Brooks Kepka, Daniel Berger, How's your Berger, Scotty Scheffler, Robert McIntyre, and Dustin Johnson. Uh, so there's 12 qualified players to cash top 10s. 10 of them either had multiple top 10s in their three lead up tournaments or had strokes gain putting in the prior event so we're going to weed out i mean those are two very big things but as a crossover 10 of them had those things nine of them were top 100 in the world in strokes gained around the green when the rough is average or longer now if you ever want to look at those things and there's not a lot of rough at this course which is just kind of funny to think about but it's just funny that that would be one that it really popped out with when we when i ran the back testing on a lot of this stuff so these are just weird trends and you can do that on the left hand side on fantasynational.com by the way rough length long average short whatever you want to go with the i mean if you hit it in the fescue then it's going to be long but eight of them finished inside the top 35 in DraftKings scoring for the year seven of them uh, that's per event by the way seven of them were top 40 in greens and regulation gained coming into the event on the year six of them ranked better at avoiding bogeys than they did at gaining birdies which was really interesting to think about five of them were top 30 in driving distance and we already saw how important driving distance can be four of them ranked outside the top 100 in strokes gained off the tee three of them ranked inside top 20 in par three scoring two of them ranked outside the top 50 in strokes gained tee to green on weekend rounds of round three and round four and one of them was that's the, this is the countdown. We go from 10 to 9 here. One of them was a top 50 in fairways gained, and obviously that guy was the winner of the event in Colin Morikawa. So Morikawa was excellent. There'll be more Morikawa stats. So the Morikawa profile going in 
to last year's event was kind of what we're looking for, either major performance or top 10 performance coming in. He doesn't have that so far this year, although if he he has a top 10 at the major, that's huge. He has a top 10 at the Masters this year already, that's huge. If he comes like top 10 at the Scottish Open, then he's going to fit every trend line that we're looking for coming in. But here is his lead up last year. Obviously, he had the win in Mexico. Uh, It wasn't in Mexico, it was at the concession. It was WGC Mexico in Florida. But here's his lead in for me. He was fourth at the U.S. Open. He was he missed the cut. No, he, he made the cut at the Scottish Open. That because it was a DP event. It's not included in this PGA Tour run up. Uh, but he's like T seventy one or something like that. But before that, you know, top ten, top ten coming in U.S. Open Memorial T four T two. Then he wins the Open Championship. He was having a much better year. Look at this run of irons from Colin Morikawa. It's funny that right afterwards he wins the Open and then he struggles with his irons for like four events. When he won the PGA Championship, I feel like it was actually. Very much the same, yeah. He got back on it a little bit easier, but again, it wasn't the normal Morikawa... I am awesome with my irons and gaining 7.5 like per event. Like that's my, that's my floor with iron play. He's not quite back there yet, but we've seen the spikes from him. And that's really interesting. So, I mean, I love me some Colin Borikawa. You're probably not going to talk me out of it, but he had four straight top 20 finishes, uh, except for at the Scottish Open, despite losing with the putter in four of the five measured events over that stretch. Uh, overall putting numbers are underwhelming, but he had picked up strokes in the five to 10 foot range in the seven events prior to winning the Open. So maybe that's something we can throw in too. That that's a key range when you're trying to avoid bogeys, making seven foot putts, it's going to help a lot. And he was dominating greens and regulation. He gained over five greens and regulation on the field over his previous six PGA events. Uh, we take a look at the winner profile from Shane Lowry in 2019 at Portrush. Obviously that was a big bombers course. Didn't work out for Rory so much, but we can take a look at his lead in form and how that was going to work out. It was super windy that year. Uh, of the top 15 after Thursday, nine of them cashed a top 11 paycheck, so they got it to the hot start, and that was good enough. His form this year actually kind of mimics his form. I mean, he played really well post-Masters that year, and he's just been playing well all year outside of the U.S. Open, but coming in, he had the top 10s, that great lead-in form, a good finish at the U.S. Open, and he was kind of disastrous before that, and then boom, all of a sudden you get to Northern Ireland, Shane Lowry is your winner. Uh, only two of the top 55 players that week, crazily enough, were inside the top 55 in driving distance for the year coming in, but eight of them were top 50 in bogey avoidance, and only one of them was top 75 in opportunities gained for the year, which is really strange to think about. Uh, obviously, J.B. Holmes you know, sucked the life out of Brooks Kepka in the final round. If you want to take the Zach Johnson profile <coughs> from 2015, so we'll go take a look at ZJ, <coughs> see what his form was like coming in to 2015. Let's go down here. There's the win. Top 10s in his previous two starts before the Open Championship. I mean, that's pretty clutch to look at i would say like two or three that's really been one of the key indicators coming in is the recent form on these guys they come in hot hot fire coming in uh, of the top 10 qualified players on the final leaderboard eight of them were top 30 for the season in DraftKings points six of them were top 50 in driving distance and outside the top 90 in fairways gained nine of them were top 50 in birdies or better gains six were top 25 four were top 10 eight were 45th and better in par four and par three scoring actually just coming into the week not uh, not during the week so if we just kind of let's make up a new model here extra model since we got time people want to know more about the open championship don't they who wouldn't who doesn't want to watch an hour and a half long show to start off your weekend in terms of what we can dig into here in the stats and it's funny that people actually watch the show kind of uh we'll call this uh st andrews extra and try to just put in those stats to see what it tells us uh st andrews St. Andrews, extra, extra gum. Chew it. What do we have here? What did I say did really well? But this is just what I do every week for my research anyway. I feel like I would just record it and continue to ramble on about everything. Do I have DraftKings points as something I can put in here? I do have DraftKings points. So DraftKings points we'll throw in. We'll throw in birdie or better gained because nine of the top 50 did that. I said par three, strokes game par three was one of them. Uh, birdie or better on the field was one of them. Where are my birdie or better stats? Greens and regulation gained. Birdie or better gained. There we are. Uh, obviously driving distance 
was one of them as well. And this is, again, back in 2015. This may not apply whatsoever, but I think it's fun to look at as we go through it. Uh, and if I could put a negative rating on something like Fairway's game, that would actually kind of do it. So let's just weight these 25% each. Obviously, that's not exactly what they mean, but we'll give them even distribution in this extra model and see what it actually spits out in terms of the... This is uh, St. Andrew's extra model for trends from 2015. And just see what happens. What is this past 50 or past 24 rounds? Here's what we have. And we probably just want to look at the season. So we'll go past 50 rounds. And we'll just use the season at hand of 2022. So we're not going to take any extra information because that's how the information was extracted last time was directly from that. So our best player is no joke. Scotty Scheffler. Why does he only have four rounds? Because I have a Gusta, Gusta National clicked on. That makes a lot more sense. Let's go to all courses and see what this actually spits us out. To, uh, I mean, this is probably not accurate anyway, but that would make it even less accurate at the same time. Rory is number one. Rory, Scheffler, Thomas, Shoffley, Zalatoris. Makes a lot of sense. Burns, Hovland, Keegan, Homa, Neiman, Keith Mitchell. Okay, so we have a $6,000 player in there now. $6,900 for Keith Mitchell. Having a rough go in Scotland. That's okay. That's okay for Killa Keith. Does he have the trend line that we see? And this is a good time to utilize the mixed condition model too because you can throw a recent form into that as well. Strokes gained over the past 12 rounds or something like that if you want to. Actually, Keith Mitchell does fit the weird trend line of top 10s coming into the event. That will get shaken off a little bit because he won't come top 10 at the Scottish, more than likely. However, I mean, two out of three ain't bad. How's he done? I mean, he played at the PGA Championship. He was T34. Yeah, that's not bad. It's not bad, Killa Keith. And he's missed the cut at both his Open Championships. We won't hold that against you because we didn't really look at course history all that much uh, with a lot of this stuff. So he's up there. We'll see. Maybe people will be off of him a little bit. He was relatively popular at the Scottish. Um, but I'd probably play him over Ryan Fox at this point, to tell you the truth, if Fox is going to be like triple the ownership. Because I don't think people will get off of Ryan Fox if he has the bad week. Cam Young, Fitz, Cantlay, all the regulars. There's Shane Lowry's inside. Russell Henley, again, inside the top 20. Optimizer's going to be loving some Russell Henley next week. Justin Rose, again. Man, Justin Rose. Gooch, again. So it's all like the same, similar type of things that are going on, uh, no matter how we kind of divvy up a lot of this stuff. We still have Kirk, Power again, Spieth, Connors, Webb Simpson, even in the shorter term, is doing well uh, coming into it. There's Burned. He's now up there as well. Lucas Herbert. I can see it with Herbert. He's played Lynx courses really well over the course of his career. It's like Magic Beansy, but... I mean, Magic Beans guys end up doing really... Mackenzie Hughes was inside the top eight last year. Cash is a nice each way on that as well because he's the king of Magic Beans when it comes down to it. Dietrich only has 12 rounds. Wiesberger has eight rounds. Ryan Fox only has six weighted rounds with a lot of this stuff, but we just know he's been on a tear on the DP World Tour, so we can kind of lean out of that a little bit. It's funny to think about Mackenzie Hughes is 47th by all of these rankings. Uh, that's Now I'm going to throw Mac Hughes on the list. Give my Canadians a shout out here. 68 hundred dollars how has he played at the masters i feel like he was good leishman still inside the top 50 as well how did he play at the masters this year i feel like he made the cut he did he was 50th he's made the cut twice each of the past two years but no decent results all like bez in that circumstance bez also a part of team magic beans when it comes down to it wyndham clark is first in driving distance that's still only good enough to make him 55th in the overall because he's not inside the top 50 in any of the other things Birdies are better. Just take, take a look at it this year. Scheffler, Smith, Rory, Cam Young, Xander. Anyone that kind of weirdly pops up. Max Homa, Varner, Rose. Again, man, Rose is Rose having a better year than I thought he was? I feel like he's not having a good year. Why does he keep popping up on the stats? Is just the, the putter not there? I mean, the putter's been there twice. He hasn't put it all together at once. He was fourth in Canada, 37th at the U.S. Open. He's, he's played well at the majors. Didn't play well at the Masters. Played well at the other two majors. Top 15 in both, so... If he can squeeze out a top 10 at the Scottish Open, he fits exactly the trend lines that we're looking for. I have no idea what his odds are even for next week. Either way, those are the trend lines. Those are the extra models. And that's what I wanted to look at on FantasyNational.com. Once again, FantasyNational.com slash Mayo to get that 20% off any level and research, whatever you want. And that'll do it on the Pat Mayo Experience. Thanks for joining us. Once again, fantasynational.com slash Mayo. Get you 20% off. Big thanks to Steve Banford for coming on the show, breaking down the trends, talking about the course. Some of the corollaries was fun stuff. 
and it gave me some good insight to maybe who I want to take this week. I'll be talking it out throughout the rest of the week with all of my guests. Opinions are most definitely going to change. What won't change is how you enter the giveaway draws, the rating and reviews for the audio podcast. You've done it once. You've done it 10 times. You do it again to bump your name back to the top of the list. 500 bucks to first place. A master's polo to second. Maybe we'll add on some more throughout the course of the week. You want to know the secret way to get all the ballots into the draw? Subscribe to the Mayo Media Network exclusive free newsletter that's down in the description. They'll be coming out most nights during the week, during the Open Championship, then back to once a week as well. Smash a like on the way out, sub to the channel, follow me on Twitter at the PME, and that will do it for me. I'll see you next time. Experience. Experience.